Welcome back everybody. In today's video, we are going to take a look at the paper titled A Deeper Look at Experience Replay. We're gonna go ahead and code up the relevant module from this paper to test it out on our own machines. Now the basic idea here is that ever since the advent of deep Q learning, people have been using a an experience replay buffer with a memory size of 1 million transitions. They've never really taken a look at that particular hyperparameter of deep reinforcement learning, and that's what they're addressing in this paper. Now, spoiler alert, it's going to be a little bit difficult to replicate the results exactly. Uh, they do come up with a new take on experience replay that we're going to implement in this video tutorial, but we're not going to actually get to replicate their results, and I'm not entirely certain why. Perhaps we can figure it out as we go along. The idea here is, as I said, that the buffer size is chosen to be 10 to the 6, a million transitions, and that is taken for granted. Now, uh, there are a number of innovations like, say, hierarchical, excuse me, uh, hindsight experience replay and prioritized experience replay that have a totally different take on experience replay. Now, in particular, prioritized experience replay will attempt to assign higher probability of sampling to the most recent transitions, with the logic being that those most recent transitions are probably the most helpful because they come from a more evolved, so to speak, policy. Now, the combined experience replay is going to do something very similar where instead of assigning a probability, it's going to be totally deterministic. We are certainly going to sample the most recent transition, and we are going to then sample uh, batch size minus one other transitions using our uniform random sampling distribution. Before we go any further, a shameless plug. If you would like to learn how to implement deep reinforcement learning papers, check out my courses on Udemy on sale now. Link in the description below, including my new course on curiosity-driven deep reinforcement learning. Now, perhaps the most interesting thing about this paper is the sort of combative tone that the author takes. And you can tell this isn't written by Sutton because it's written uh, by a non-native English speaker. That's pretty clear from reading it. So uh, Sutton gave uh, Jang more or less free reign to kind of take digs at the reinforcement learning community, which is quite surprising. Uh, only in the case of, you know, such a giant like Sutton could you get away with such a thing. If you were to attempt to do this, your paper would be squashed, and it certainly wouldn't be cited over 100 times, as Google Scholar would indicate for this paper. So as an example of what I'm talking about, uh, he writes, although algorithms in pre-deep RL era do not need to care about how to stabilize a neural network, they do care data efficiency. If experience replay is a perfect idea, it should already be widely used in early ages, meaning if it's so great, why didn't people happen upon it earlier? However, unfortunately, to our best knowledge, no previous work has shown what is wrong with experience replay. So it's automatically assuming there's something wrong with experience replay, despite its success in numerous other papers, numerous other bodies of work in the field, and it's taking a very combative tone right out of the gate, and I kind of like it. Another example is, in other words, the size of the replay buffer, which has been underestimated by the community for a long time, is an important task-dependent hyperparameter that needs careful tuning. Now, it may very well be the case that that is true, and our own uh, experiments in this particular video will show that the size of the replay buffer does play a role in the learning of the agent. Uh, but that's not the sort of tone you would typically see authors use in their paper where they're saying... Uh, you know, the one that the, and this important hyperparameter has been underestimated by the community for a long time. You don't just see that kind of aggressive language. So in this particular work, they're going to compare a few different variants. So they're going to perform, they're going to compare what I would call naive deep Q learning, where you uh, just bolt a neural network to the Q learning algorithm and see what happens. They're also going to compare, they call that online Q. They're going to uh, take a look at buffer-like deep Q learning, which is just deep Q learning as we've come to know it, where you store the most recent transition into an agent's replay buffer. And finally, they're going to compare combined Q learning. And they're going to use several different test beds, uh, Grid World, Lunar Lander, and uh, the Pong environment. Now, we won't use the Grid World or Pong. We're going to focus on the Lunar Lander because it's relatively easy. And we're going to skip the... Uh, online Q learning algorithm because we kind of know it's bad already. So there's no point to look at that. So we're going to take a look at the effect of buffer size on deep Q learning as well as on this, this new formula, this new uh, way of doing memory sampling uh, combined uh, experience replay. Now for our purposes, the relevant plot from this paper is figure five. And 
you see a number of different plots here. On the far left, we have online queue. And of course, the replay buffer doesn't matter there because there isn't a replay buffer. However, in buffer queue, which is deep queue learning as we've come to know it, you do see a pretty strong dependence on the size of the replay buffer. Now, one other thing that sticks out to me is that this agent doesn't even achieve a score of even zero points. As you know from the uh, Lunar Lander environment, uh, a high score is like 200 points. If you can hit 200 points, it's considered solved. If you can do that, uh, you hit the goal. If you can do that over 100 consecutive games, then you've solved the environment more or less. And this particular setup doesn't even get to zero points, which is quite strange to me. That sticks out right away as being very bizarre. Even in 2018 on this channel, we were solving this environment on the regular so it's not uh, not immediately obvious to me why they were having so much difficulty but nonetheless we're going to use my own architecture for this we're not going to use their exact details because their results aren't particular great aren't particularly great but it does show a dependence where as uh, the purple and kind of like a yellow brownish line show at higher experience replay um, memory sizes, you get a degradation in performance relative to the smaller memory sizes. Now, when you take a look at the combined queue learning, what you see is a little bit more consistent performance uh, with respect to the larger buffer sizes. And it looks like a relatively small uplift in performance, maybe 10, 15, 20 points or so, nothing really to write home about. So it's kind of interesting that they pushed out this paper with an especially combative tone and they did make the contribution of investigating the dependence of the memory buffer size on the performance of the agent. That is certainly interesting. Uh, but this combined Q, combined experience replay buffer doesn't seem to have a huge effect as far as I can tell here. Uh, and that's quite interesting to me. It makes me wonder about the prioritized experience replay as well. But maybe I'm missing something. Maybe you can see something in this plot that I do not. Perhaps I'm reading it wrong. I suppose that's always possible. Leave a comment down below if you think I've made a mistake in my analysis here or if you think this is showing something other than what I'm saying it's showing. Other thing to note is that they do take a look at the Pong environment and they don't want to uh, they don't want to muddy the waters using convolutional neural networks so they just use the byte representation of the environment. Remember that you can use the memory dump from the Atari emulator as an input vector to your deep neural network. That's a perfectly valid approach and they do that using a relatively small deep neural network and they show the results here and of course it's much more erratic uh, they're only averaging over 30 games so you do have quite a bit of noise here again the same thing that sticks out to me is it's not even coming close to solving the environment right uh, a deep q learning agent within a couple hours even using uh, using the convolutional neural networks anyway can achieve a score of around 20 points 21 points if you've taken my deep q learning courses you'll know that uh, we can solve this environment relatively quickly in short order. So it's kind of strange here that they uh, don't achieve really good results using their particular architecture. And they even point that out here. It says it's expected the agent doesn't solve the Pong environment as, as it's difficult to approximate the state value function with a single hidden layer network. But that raises the question, you know, why didn't you just you know, add on the extra couple layers for a convolutional neural network. It really isn't much more work. It's only 10 more minutes of coding, if that. Why didn't they go ahead and add on that extra information uh, to allow the agent to actually have the best case performance and then really compare the combined experience replay to the current state of the art, which was, you know, the paper from 2015 and, of course, all the other advancements since then. So I don't know why they made that choice. Um, Sutton is obviously a brilliant mind. Uh, I wonder to what extent he was involved in this research. It was probably a simple project for a graduate student to undertake. And he said, here, you, you look at the effect of experience replay on the size of the buffer, excuse me, on the performance of the agent. And that this paper does that quite well, where it does show that, at least in the case of Pong, you get really terrible performance using a smaller buffer. And then up here, it's actually the opposite in the lunar lander environment, where you see... Um, poor performance with larger buffer sizes and, and then a sort of sweet spot in the middle of around like a thousand transitions or so. Okay, so all that said, let's recap the general idea of their combined experience replay buffer. Let's take a look. Uh, do they have the algorithm? So if you take a look here, um, it's pretty straightforward stuff. Initialize your value function and replay buffer, get your state. 
while the state is in terminal select an action according to an Epsilon greedy policy. The other thing to note here uh, is that they didn't decay Epsilon over time. They used a constant fixed value of Epsilon of 0.1. We'll do the same. Uh, it doesn't make a huge difference in performance. Uh, it's just an interesting choice on their part. Store the transition, the replay buffer, sample a batch of transitions, and, upload, and uh, update the value function Q with B and T. And that's given up here where they say uh, another contribution that we propose is a simple method to remedy blah, blah, blah. To be more specific, whenever we sample a batch of transitions, we add the latest transition to the batch and use the corrected batch to train the agent. So I take that as being that they're going to sample the most recent transition as well as batch size minus one of other randomly sampled distribution, randomly sampled memories. And so that is supported here when they say that, however, PER, meaning prioritize experience replay, is still a stochastic replay method, which means giving the latest transition a largest priority does not guarantee it will be replayed immediately. So then CER is guaranteeing that the latest transition gets replayed immediately, at least according to my reading. Again, if you think I've missed something here, then by all means, leave a comment down below to let me know what it is. All that said, let's head to the terminal and code up our combined experience replay buffer. We're not going to code the full DQN agent. I would recommend that you clone the my YouTube repo and uh, just use the uh, given deep Q learning agent because I've done many, many videos on deep Q learning on this channel. I'll link to a playlist. Uh, I don't have... I don't really feel it's necessary to code another one on camera again, so go ahead, if you don't already have a deep Q learning agent laying around, then go ahead and clone this, this repo and run the DQN agent from there. Okay, so we're going to code our memory file, and our only dependence for this is going to be NumPy, and our class is going to be pretty straightforward. Remember, the only real modification to the replay memory buffer that we're going to be making is that we want to have this option to do combined experience replay where we sample the most recent transition in addition to the uh, randomly sampled other transitions. So our initializer is going to have a number of parameters, uh, input dims, max mem, batch size, and a boolean to indicate whether or not we want to do the combined experience replay. So I'm going to make this into a general memory where we can either turn on or off the experience replay buffer. And then we're going to code up uh, a main loop that allows us to uh, parse some command line arguments to automate the process of uh, testing all six possible combinations or multiple combinations depending on whatever replay buffer sizes you want to use. And then we're going to plot those to generate plots that are similar to what you see in the paper. Now we're going to represent um, our memories as NumPy arrays. This is my preferred method of doing it. There are a number of other ways of doing it that are equally valid. It's just uh, how I've chosen to do things. And we have to be careful about the uh, data type because PyTorch gets a little bit picky about data types. Our memory is going to be a series of integers because we're taking integer actions. Our rewards are going to be floating point numbers, of course. And we're going to be using uh, a terminal memory to keep track of terminal states because the value of the terminal state is always zero. That'll come into play when we update our uh, value function and our learn function for the agent. Other thing to note is I am using an older version of 
uh, PyTorch and Py, excuse me, of NumPy. NumPy likes to change things around quite a bit. So this used to previously be unsigned int eight or something like that, uh, where we would use an unsigned unsigned integer to handle the uh, Boolean flags. Now we have to do mp.bool. Who knows what it will be in the future? We need a function to store a transition. And what we have to do here is determine uh, the first available position to store a memory. So our memory counter keeps track of the first available memory, or uh, yeah, first available memory. And we want to take the modulus with the mem size because we want to overwrite the earliest memories. Then all we have to do is save our uh, relevant variables in the in the relevant position of their relevant uh, NumPy arrays. And of course, we want to increment our memory counter by one to make sure we keep, are keeping track of the fact that we've actually filled up our memories. Next, we need our sample memory function. And this is where all of the modifications happen. So we have to know whether or not we are doing combined experience replay. And if we are doing combined experience replay, then we want to make sure to sample the most recent action. And so we're going to have some offset. So um, if we're doing combined replay, then we want to offset by one. And if not, we're going to offset by zero because we want to take, uh, we want to be sure to take the most recent memory. And so then we're going to have batch size minus one other memories that we want to sample. So we just say offset equals one if self.combined else zero. And then our max memory is going to be the minimum of the mem counter mem size minus that offset. And so what that'll do is only allow us to sample memories we've actually filled up with something other than zeros. We don't want to sample zeros because we're not going to learn anything from that. And then we take care of the offset because the uh, agent will always sample the most recent transition. Now looking at it, this may be not quite what I intend, uh, but it works, which I will demonstrate from the terminal after we finish this so that you can see that uh, this is indeed what the authors intend, or at least my coding of it corresponds to what I interpret their intentions to be. So now we need our batch of memories. So we want to get uh, from zero to max mem in size, batch size minus offset. And we don't want to replace memories. So once we sample a memory, we don't want to sample it twice. Then we can dereference that batch to get our actual states and whatnot. Then we have to take care of uh, what we're going to do if we actually have a combined experience replay. So we're going to say if combined, then um, we want to know, excuse me, modulus. We want to know what the position of the last stored memory is. And since we increment mem counter after saving a memory, we have to subtract one from it to get the most recent memory. If we just take mem counter, we're going to get a zero from our memories. So then we'll say last action. Uh, last state. Last new state. Sorry, this is an awkward position to be typing in. And then we need terminal, right? Now we have to append the last 
uh, last state action reward and terminal flag to our uh, batch of memories. So we'll say actions np append so we're going to append the last action to our action batch and do something similar for the others so we'll say states we want a v stack because Uh, we want to vstack the current state memory with the last state. Reason being is that the state memory is arranged in memory size along the rows, along the rows, and then uh, the states along the uh, columns axis. So we want to add another row to our particular uh, set of states and do the same thing for the new states. And then it's going to be upset because of my formatting. Let's fix that. And then we'll say last reward. And that's just going to be, sorry, uh, rewards <laughs> equals mp append. And then we have uh, the terminals. And finally, return everything. And now that I'm reading this, um, it looks like you could probably just substitute uh, like rewards or terminals or new states, etc. Here, you don't have to write. Uh, you don't have to be so explicit there. I was just being a little pedantic when I was writing it out for the purposes of being extra special clear on YouTube, but you can certainly shorten this. This isn't the most brief way of writing the code. Finally, we need a function to determine if we have filled up enough memories to go ahead and sample. Now, we don't want to sample uh, our memories before we have filled a batch size of them because we don't want to learn from a subset. We have to pass a batch through our deep neural network. So let's just say uh, we have a, a function called is sufficient, and it's going to return mem counter greater than batch size. So once we've filled up batch size of memories, then it's okay to go ahead and start sampling the memory. And that's really it for the core of the changes with the uh, combined experience replay buffer. Let's uh, hit escape. It looks like it may be unhappy about something up here. Uh, what is it saying? Blank line contains white space. And this one is not indented enough. It's unhappy about that. Now it's happy. Okay. So we can exit that. And I have the DQN torch file here. We're just going to go look at that very briefly. So we're going to need torch, torch NN, functional, optim, numpy, and our replay memory. Our deep net Q network is just going to be a series of three linear layers. We're going to take input dims, convert them to FC1 dims, and then we're going to have a second fully connected layer and then an output layer that outputs number of actions. We'll have our optimizer. We'll use Atom. I think they use RMS prop in the paper. We need our loss function device and to send our network to the device. Then we want to pass, uh, for the forward propagation, we want to pass a state through the network, activating with ReLU functions and uh, using an unactivated final layer and returning that. Our agent class has a bunch of hyperparameters. So if you want to do epsilon decrement, if you meaning you start at epsilon 1 and then work your way down to some minimum value, uh, then you would use the supplied default parameters, 5 by 10 to the minus 4 and 0 0.05 for an epsilon end. Otherwise, we're going to need things like gamma, the discount parameter, the starting value for epsilon learning rate, input dims, batch size, number of actions, whether or not we want to do a combined experience replay and then a max memory size, which is going to be our main variable we play with for this particular experiment. Save everything, get an action space uh, that you're going to use for random action sampling, uh, call your replay memory. Uh, one of the things you're going to need to know is whether or not it's time to replace your target network. So I use iter count 
uh, for that, and then a replace target of every 100 steps. That's another hyperparameter to play with. Uh, it's something I don't think they give the value in the paper. Maybe they do, but I don't remember. Then, of course, we're going to need two different Q networks. Uh, this Q next is really the target network. I should call it Q target. Uh, 256 fully connected DIMMs for each of those neural networks. And the choose action function, we're going to use epsilon greedy action selection. So if a random number is greater than epsilon, then find the maximal action according to your current estimate of the Q value for that particular state. Otherwise, take an action at random and in any event, return that action. Now in the learn function, we want to make sure that if we haven't filled a batch size, we're not going to learn. So we just say if the memory is insufficient, then return back to the main program. And we'll say uh, start by uh, zeroing our optimizer's gradients, getting our batch index, and getting our states, actions, rewards, and new states, to converting those to PyTorch tensors. And then here, uh, the reason you need that batch index is just for uh, proper array, uh, proper tensor indexing in PyTorch. So you're going to get the value of the current states for the uh, actions the agent actually took. And you want to get the value of the new states according to the target network. Make sure that the values for those uh, terminal new states are zero. And then calculate your reward for the update function of your Q network. And that's just rewards plus... Uh, the value of the maximal action according to the target network for the new states. Then you have your loss function. It's a mean squared error loss between the Q target and Q eval. Q eval is the actual parameters generated by your online network, and Q target is generated by the target network. Back propagate, step your optimizer, and uh, increase your iter count. Uh, decrement your epsilon, and if it's time, meaning if the iter count modulus of the replaced target is zero, every 100 steps you want to uh, proceed to load the state dictionary uh, from the evaluation network to the target network. As a very, very brief crash course in deep Q learning, that's the network and stuff we're going to use for this particular project. Now we need our main file, so let's head into that. Now I want to have the capability of doing some uh, command line uh, training of this, so we're going to be passing in parameters for the command line. So we're going to import arg parse. We're going to need to import Jim. We're going to need our agent and numpy. So good grief, good grief. If name equals main, then arg parse dot argument parser. I'm just going to use an empty description. We're going to add uh, the batch size as an argument. And we're going to default that to 1000. We're going to add another argument. And that's going to be CER. And that's type of bool. Now, supply it then true so if you supply anything for the CER argument it interprets it as true because it's type bool it's just looking for whether or not you have the presence of that particular argument so keep that in mind passing in dash CER true or false does nothing because it defaults it interprets both the true and false as true so that took me a few minutes to realize as I was running this uh, it's something I totally slipped my mind so we want to make our lunar lander environment, and that's v2. Um, get our combined argument args.bs. We're going to use the default value of epsilon of 0 0.1, a batch size of 64. For the lunar lander environment, we have four actions. We have our epsilon n. We're going to use 0 0.1 like they do in the paper. Uh, the lunar lander environment has eight input dims. A little bit of a high learning rate. Uh, 0 0.01. Max mem size equals buffer size. And combined equals combined. So I want to keep track of the scores and epsilons over time. You know, we don't actually need that epsilon history, I take it back. 
I take it back. Uh, reason being is you can plot, the purpose of that is you can plot the agent score versus epsilon. Here we're gonna use a constant value so it doesn't make any sense to plot a constant line. We're gonna play 500 games at the top of each game reset the score and terminal flag and environment uh, each each episode you want to select an action according to the agents choose action function take that action get the new state and reward use that to increment your total score store your transition in the agent's memory store everything learn at the end of every episode um, calculate save your score calculate your average and then do a simple print statement. So we're gonna to wanna to know whether or not we are uh, running the combined experience replay buffer or not, which episode we're on, the score, average score, our agent's epsilon, And then we're going to save our, now we're going to save the NumPy arrays so that we can later print them out or plot them. So if combined F name equals CER constant epsilon plus so our file name is going to be uh, if combined is going to be CER for combined experience replay using a constant epsilon with uh, a string representation of the buffer size since that's the main variable we're changing around. Otherwise, we're gonna use uh, VER for vanilla experience replay. Um, use whatever you want, that's just what my uncreative mind came up with. Then we wanna save that uh, NumPy array of the scores in that file name. And that is what will give us um, the material we're gonna to use to do some plots. So uh, let us, first of all, uh, take a look here. Oh, I call it score, don't I, right there. So there, now that's happy. Oh, I forgot to actually, uh, yeah, so I have to say, args equals parser dot add uh, sorry parser dot parse args there we go and it's unhappy it's always going to be unhappy because that's too long of a line okay so we'll leave that anything else tripping it up nope now we can leave oh you wow you are upset about that aren't you aren't you you know what Fine, fine. Uh, let's do that. All right. One of the downsides of Vim. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is run it to make sure there are no typos. And then I'm gonna demonstrate uh, the following arguments are required, oh, of course. So uh, we will do Oh, you know what? I must have forgotten the... Let me take a look. Yeah, I forgot the the dash here. So if you don't have a dash, it makes it required. If you do have a dash, it makes it optional. So let's try it again. And just make sure it works. Okay, so all the code executes. Now I want to demonstrate how that uh, combined experience replay actually works. 
All right, so here we are a few hours later. Sorry, I had to take care of something and then come back to recording the rest of the video at a later time in the day. So what I wanna do is demonstrate how this combined experience replay buffer works to you. So we're just gonna put in some simple print statements and track our memories over time to make sure we're getting precisely what we expect. So the first thing I wanna do is take a look at the main file and I want to set the batch size to something pretty small like four because we don't want to print out too many things to the terminal at once. And then I want the agent to choose an action at random because uh, if we're initializing everything our neural network waits at random it may end up choosing the same action over and over which won't be particularly useful for us when we're trying to track what actions were taken and what actions were sampling. So we're going to say action space dot sample so that we get an action at random and we change the batch size and we will supply a buffer size and CER when we run the program. So next I want to take a look at the memory and what I want to do is um, I want to use a dummy value for the action memory something the agent can't actually take so an action outside of our action space so I'll say self Action memory equals nine ones. Do you type np int 32? So it's going to print out a whole bunch of nines in the dummy spaces. So it'll have a bunch of integers between zero and three, and then a bunch of nines for actions we haven't taken instead of zeros. Because a zero is a valid action. If we see a zero, it doesn't tell us anything about. Um, what our algorithm is doing. And then coming down here, I want to do a debug statement. I want to print out a batch, an action memory, and the uh, actions. And then if our mem counter Greater than 24, we're going to exit the program because there's no point in printing forever. But then I do have to make one modification to the uh, agent file. We oh, I already put it in, so we'll have a return statement here. And the point of that is I don't want to learn with an illegal action of nine. It won't. Uh, it probably yeah, it won't even work uh, because nine isn't a valid output for the deep neural network. So we put the return statement here so that we don't actually try to update any weights. Then we can write quit and then we can run the program with a buffer size of 10 and combine experience replay true. And so it gives us a bunch of output. And so right here on the first line, you see a big sequence of nines. That's interesting for the action sampling. It's uh, it's getting a whole bunch of identical values, which is sort of annoying. So let's verify that our batching is working correctly for us. So three, two, and one. So we should have zero, one, two, three. So the first element should be a two, which it is. Then we should have a second element, which is this. And the first element is a two. So we should have two, two, two. And then we should have uh, a two because it's the last action before the nine. And that isn't particularly illustrative because there are all twos Anyway, so let's move on. Uh, we've advanced our mem counter one step. So the first action right before the nine is a three. So our last action in our actions array should be a three, which it is over here. And then we have a zero, which is corresponds to a three. That matches up here. One, which is a two. That matches up here. And then the third element is a two. So that's a two. Okay. So that looks like it's working. So then the next one is a zero, right? Because that's right before the nine. So our final element in the actions should be a zero because that's the last action we actually took, which it is. And then we have zero, one, and two for our batch, which is three, two, two. So lo and behold, we get three, two, two, zero, as we would expect. Then the... Um, Next action before the nine is a three, so the final element is a three. Okay, that matches up. And three, five, two, so that's this, this, so two, three, two, that's what we see, two, three, two, three, okay. But now the nine is here, so we filled up our memory, so the last element should be a two, and it is. Now, for the next action, now for the next 
time step, we have gone back to the beginning of the memory buffer and should be overriding the first memory. So this is a one instead of a three. So it is doing that right up here. It's a three and now it's a one. So one should be our last element here and it is. Then we should have a one, one, three, three. Uh, sorry, now I'm, what was it? Uh, now I've gotten confused. One, one, three, 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 one. Yeah, that matches three, one, and three again. Then a three, yep, a two, a one, a one, and a zero. So all of those work. So it is indeed taking the last action sampled and appending that to the end of the actions array. And it is, the batching is working correctly. 763 will give you a, um, a three, uh, a one, and a one, so three, one, one, zero. So, okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that this is working correctly and this is what the authors intend. So now we can undo all of that. So let's go back to main and start there, I suppose, and convert our batch size back to 64, uh, delete our line with the random action sampling, go to DQN torch, get rid of this return statement, go to memory, get rid of that, use our actual zeros, and get rid of our print statement. Okay, so now we're ready to uh, let's just clear this to make it easier to see. So now we're ready to run a whole slew of games and see how it actually works. So what I want to do is, remember we use the arg parser, I want to input all the commands at once so I just hit enter one time and then walk away and come back to some results. So we're going to say python main and then uh, we're going to do batch size 1000. Uh, that is the default value but we're, we're just going to be uh, extra clear so we know what we're doing and we're not going to use combined experience replay and then we're going to run a batch size of 10,000 without experience without combined experience replay and then run it again with a batch size of uh, 100,000 and then we're going to turn on the experience replay the combined experience replay excuse me CER true batch size 1000 batch size 10000 main.py cr true batch size 100000 okay so fingers crossed i'm going to start running that and then when it's done oh you know what we didn't even write the we didn't even write the uh, plot file did we uh, you know, let's run it and then we're gonna, then we'll write the plot file when it's done. So let's do that now. We can write the plot file after it's done because it's gonna save everything to NumPy array files. Okay, so now that is running and I'll be back in a few minutes. And as that is running, I realized I made a mistake. And the mistake I made, I already have it open, here is this. So uh, this should be indented one over. We don't want to be saving the NumPy array every single time we finish an episode that is excessive read and write to the disk, excessive wear and tear on your hardware for no good reason. So now I'm going to run it again and uh, we're going to come back after a little while to take a look at the results. Okay, so let's assume it is finished running. I've used the magic of editing. Uh, I've already obviously run this code in a separate directory where I've uh, tested it out to make sure everything works. So I'm going to skip ahead because it takes a couple hours for all of that to run or maybe an hour or so. And I have many other things to do. So I'm going to skip ahead and uh, just get to the point of coding this uh, plot file so you can see the results. So we're gonna need numpy matplotlib as plt. We're going to need our various uh, files. So uh, combined experience replay 1000. We're going to load up all of those files. We're going to yank and paste and paste again. And then we're going to add in a 
zero because that's really all we're changing between them. Add in two zeros there for the 100K. Give it an extra line and then yank again and paste, change that to V for vanilla. So it's unhappy about that. Oops, blank line. Okay. Now we can do running, not in caps, running CER 1K average MP0s len. So this is going to keep track of our running average with the previous 100 games. Yank. So we're going to need to paste two. Whoops. Good grief. Yank. Paste. And paste. Oh my goodness. Vim fail. All right. Yank that line. Paste it. Let's just yank all three. Paste all three now. We can do the same thing with just replacing letters. Add in zero there. 1K, 10K. I'm definitely going to make a mistake here, aren't I? And that's 1K, 10K, 100K. And really, I think they're all the same length. They're just uh, 500 games, so it really shouldn't matter. But I'm being extra explicit to be safe. So then we say for I in range length of CER. Yeah, they're all the same length. So it's fine running average. CER 1K, sorry, CER 1K average I equals MP mean max of zero or I minus 100 up to I plus one. Like that. Yank that. Paste. Paste again. So then we insert our zero for 10K, 100K. And we do need to make sure that we're taking the correct arrays there. Paste, switch the C to the V. And do the same here. That should be okay. So then we have all of our running averages and then we can handle the business of plotting, which is pretty straightforward. So we are gonna plot, uh, for this I'm just gonna plot the, um, the, the, the combined experience replay versus the uh, vanilla experience replay. Uh, if you want, you can change it around to do the plots for the 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 for each type of replay respectively. I'm just gonna compare the two directly right off the bat because we already know uh, this will indeed show better performance of the uh, shorter uh, replay buffers we get a bit of, de bit of degradation at higher replay buffers. So we're gonna see kind of the same thing. So our x-axis is just gonna be uh, the number of episodes. Our x-axis running average, uh, sorry, running CER 1K average in red, label equals CER 1000. Yep, I'm gonna plot VR1K average, make that blue. X label episode. Be nice if I used quotes for a string. Y label average score. 
We need a legend with a location in the lower right. It's going to interfere with my ugly mug, I think. And then PLT save fig. BR cons epsilon PNG. And then we can insert an underscore here. And then we can be bold, yank, paste, good grief. Of course, of course, paste, and then paste again. Get rid of that blank line, then we can Change this to 10K, oops, undo, insert, CR, 10K, 10K, add an, an extra zero here. And then similarly down here, Okay, the, um, doesn't look like there's any issues. And everything should be right. I've run this a few times, as you can tell. So let's see. Okay, so it works. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up the plots now so you can see them. Okay, so here and you can see the 1,000, 10,000, and 100,000 comparisons between the combined experience replay and the vanilla experience replay. So for the 1,000 and 10,000, performance isn't very good. So it manages to get up to about zero points or so, which isn't very impressive. Uh, it does learn, but it doesn't learn very well, shall we say. And it's pretty clear that in this case, the combined experience replay doesn't really win you all that much. They are pretty much the same. They're within run-to-run -run variation. Now, if you take a look at the 100,000 case, you see that 100,000 does a lot better than the um, 10,000 and 1,000. And uh, so replay buffer size does matter. You get significantly better performance. And in this case, for the most part, uh, for at least some band of episodes, the combined experience replay does do better, though that could be run-to-run uh, -run variation just as well. So uh, we've somewhat validated the results of the paper in the sense that, yes, the size of the replay buffer matters. It is a hyperparameter. With the Lunar Lander, it looks like 100,000 seems to be better. You could use a million and see if it improves performance even more. Uh, or you can compare to some older videos where I run it with a million and check it out. But uh, it seems that, indeed, there is a dependence on the replay buffer size. But this combined experience replay buffer doesn't really seem to help, at least in the case of a reasonably well-optimized deep Q learning network. Now in the paper, the authors used what I would call, let's say an unoptimized architecture, just a single layer, a single hidden layer. And that isn't a very deep network. And so uh, I don't, you know, I don't know what to make of that. Uh, does combined experience replay help in the case that your network architecture isn't very good? Yeah, it kind of looks like it, but so what? Your network architecture isn't very good. Your overall performance isn't very good. When you use a more, uh, more quote unquote, sophisticated architecture and get actually better results where the agent can actually learn to play the game uh, without any real hyperparameter tuning like learning parameters, you do see a bit of a difference in the use of the ex combined experience replay buffer, but it's pretty negligible and probably within run to run variation. Now, this is just one example of implementing papers. This was a pretty easy one to do. Uh, it was, to my knowledge, a first look at uh, experience replay buffer size, so I thought it was pretty interesting, and I really wanted to bring it to you guys. So I hope that was educational for you. Uh, go ahead and leave a comment down below. If you've made it this far, give me a subscribe. Don't forget, I sell courses. Shameless plug. They're linked in the description. Uh, best courses on Udemy as far as I'm concerned. All that out of the way, I hope to see you in the next video.